As some of you might be aware, I was approached by Airfix with the aim to create a Christmas themed video for their online advent calendar in 2019. Join me in this video as I build and review the Airfix Armstrong Whitworth Whitley model kit along with the creation of a winter diorama. Hi, I'm Matt and you're watching Model Minutes. As always, honourable mention to my patrons whose valued support allows me to continue making content. To find out what patronage means and the perks it gets you, take a look at the links in the description. Before I start the video I'd like to mention that Airfix provided me with the 172nd scale Armstrong Whitworth Whitley model kit, a selection of paints which consist of Humbrol 29, 30, 34, 62, 78, 85, 123 and 224 and are all enamel. I would have preferred acrylic but they didn't have them in stock. And I also received a Hornby Nordic Fir model tree which I will convert to a Christmas tree later on. And all of these items were free of charge for the purpose of review and building this diorama, but all opinions do remain my own. I previously took a look at the sprues and content of the box in an unboxing review video. So to find out more about what's included in the kit, take a look at that one. Before I start the build, a little word of warning, I do undertake some techniques during this video that may only be suitable for adult modelers. The first step in this build was to wash the plastic parts of the kit in warm soapy water. Due to the size of the plastic parts I had to forego the use of my normal plastic tub and instead used the kitchen sink. I used a washing up bowl to prevent any parts from being sucked down the plug hole in the event they became dislodged from the sprue during this cleaning process. Washing the plastic parts will help remove any oil or grease left over from the moulding process and give a good clean surface for the cement to stick to. The parts were then left to air dry on a towel. I began the build of this kit with the internal cockpit areas. Various parts were removed from their sprues and throughout this build I will do this using either a set of snips or a sharp knife. Then any excess plastic or rough areas will be cleaned up with a nail file. The amount of flash on this kit is absolutely minimal, so that won't really be a problem during this build. Tamiya extra thin cement will be used throughout the construction of this model for the most part, as I find it has good bonding properties, flows into gaps and is easy to apply with the brush included in the pot. I will at times use different products, but that will be mentioned at that time. Here the cockpit floor has been joined by a bulkhead and the two runners which will hold the navigator's chair. I then added the pilot seat, control column, engine controls, control panel and front Bombay bulkhead. These parts are all quite fine and have to be handled with care. Tweezers could be useful here to help prevent them from being placed incorrectly. The internal walls of the front part of the fuselage have additional details which have to be cemented onto them. This kit features a slightly different manner of construction compared to other aircraft I've built. Normally the fuselage comes in two halves and are cemented together. This kit however features a multi-stage fuselage which consists of the nose area of the aircraft, the rear fuselage and the roof which are all separate mouldings but you'll get to see more of that later. The floor plate for the nose gunner is added into one part of the front fuselage, but as I'm making the civilian version, it will primarily help to hold the parts together and won't be seen after construction. The bulkhead can then be cemented into place. The previously assembled cockpit area can now be glued into one of the fuselage halves. It matches up with its guide marks surprisingly well. Here I'm carefully adding a work table to the fuselage wall which locates in recesses moulded into the plastic. The legs for the navigator's table are then cemented to the tabletop and this can be cemented into place. The chair has been previously glued together and can be positioned in the runners either at the table or forward facing next to the pilot. I decided to cement mine at the table. Now it was time to paint these areas. I decided to assemble them before painting to ensure that all the plastic bonded properly. Any paint can block the bonding surfaces and result in a poor join. 
Humbrol 78 cockpit green matte enamel was then thinned with a little white spirit to help it flow better and this was then applied to the entire internal area of the cockpit and fuselage wall with a medium brush to ensure even coverage. This step was a little fiddly and it would have been easier to paint these parts on the sprue but I found that I was successful and it wasn't too difficult. As I'm using enamel, it will have a longer drying time than the acrylics I normally work with, so I did have to take that into account when I built this kit. With this paint now dry, Humbrol Satin Black Enamel number 85 was then used to pick out the internal details such as the control column and other items as indicated by the instructions. I used a fine brush to do this in an attempt to avoid placing it in the wrong location. Humbrol 62 matte leather enamel was used straight out of the tin to highlight the backrest of the pilot's seat. With all the cockpit paint now dry, Citadel non-oil acrylic black wash was used to highlight the details and create contrast between the raised and recessed details. I applied this wash using a medium brush and worked into the various details. I normally remove the excess wash with a cotton bud dipped in acrylic thinners, but as this is the cockpit and I imagine that it gets fairly grubby with use and can be hard to clean, I didn't bother with this step. Humbrol 11 acrylic silver paint was then dry brushed over various areas inside the cockpit to give a metallic effect and the impression of chipped paint. To dry brush, the paint was removed on a paper towel until only a residue remained on the brush, and then this was brushed over the model. The raised details will collect the paint, but leave any recessed areas untouched, creating more of a contrast. The cockpit decals were cut from the backing paper and then soaked in warm water. Humbrol decal fix was applied to the various controls, control panel and navigator's table prior to receiving the decals. Decal fix helps to soften the decals when they are applied and makes them blend into the details. When the transfers had released from the backing paper, they were carefully slid into position using a paintbrush or pointed tool, with any final manipulation being conducted to get them in the exact position. The decals would need to set slightly before a further coat of decal fix is applied to the top to help soften them further into the surface of the plastic parts. This kit does not come with crew figures, which is a bit of a shame. I did however have the pilot and gunner left over from the airfix Bolton Paul Defiant I previously built. These two would make perfect additions to this crew and I found that I could use one of them with no modification, but the navigator would not fit without alteration. I cut the bottom of the figure using a heated knife in order to remove excess material so that it could sit on its chair with his legs under the navigator's table. This was then sanded down to remove rough areas and also ensure a good fit. Because the floor area under the navigator's table is on a slope, one of the legs would not fit properly, so as a result it was also cut off, some of the material removed, and then it was cemented back on. I'm using Humbrol Poly Cement here as it is a little thicker and will help keep the leg in place as it dries. I continually test fit the figures to make sure that they would sit properly and made small alterations until they were seated exactly how I wanted them. Using a small amount of sticky tack, I attached them to two cotton bud sticks and then began to paint them. Humbrol 62 matte leather enamel was applied to the entire figure as a base coat. As these are meant to now be civilian crew, I wanted to stay away from RAF colours, but also being possibly something that could have been worn at the time. Whilst the figures were drying, Humbrol 135 satin acrylic varnish and 49 matte varnish were mixed together with a little water and then applied to the now dry decals. This varnish will help seal and protect the decals whilst also giving a uniform finish. I've found that the matte varnish on its own leaves a white residue as it dries, but mixing it with a small amount of the satin varnish prevents this whilst also resulting in a mostly matte finish. Some little windows are now glued into the fuselage from the inside. 
I used a general purpose glue applied carefully with the end of a cotton bud stick. This glue prevents the clear parts from fogging up, which poly cement can cause. I've done some work to the crew figures off camera, but I painted their jackets 29 matte earth, the harness and gloves 26 matte khaki, their boots 33 matte black and the buckle and goggles with 11 silver. Humbrol 61 matte flesh was used on their faces, but pretty much dry brush so that it wasn't as vibrant. And then the entire figure was given a wash with the Citadel Non Oil to help bring out the details. A little paint was scraped away from their respective seats and then Humbrol poly cement was used to glue them into place. You'll notice that the navigator's chair has been removed from its location as I found it would be easier to cement it to the figure first, then position them both in the correct place. This was quite a tight fit, but I found with some careful manipulation I could get it in the right place. And here is the finished cockpit area. It seems almost a shame to actually close the fuselage around it, as not all of it will be visible through the cockpit canopy later. It amazes me how much detail Airfix put into the internal areas of this aircraft, even knowing that it won't get seen. With that being said, it's now time to join the two halves of the cockpit fuselage. They were placed together, then Tamiya Extra Thin Cement run along the seams to bond them together. I can now put this part to one side and progress with the rest of the model. Here you can see that I've already painted the internal walls of the rest of the fuselage with the Humbrol 78 cockpit green enamel. I'm using my knife to cut out the little slots which will end up holding some of the external details later on. All those little moulded recesses you can see are for the various antenna parts for the aerial reconnaissance version of this kit, which will have to be drilled out before you progress if you are building that variant. But you don't need to do that if you're building the civilian one like me. More glazing is then glued into place, again using the same method and glue as in the previous windows from the cockpit area. The only thing I would say about this glue is that it can leave strings, so be careful when using it to avoid getting this stringy glue in unwanted areas. The walkway inside the rear fuselage was then cemented into place using Humbrol Poly Cement and Tamiya Extra Thin. I found that this part didn't quite sit as nicely in its grooves as I would have liked. Perhaps it needed bending slightly prior to installing, as I found it wanted to lift up towards the back. The other half of the rear fuselage can now be sandwiched around it and cemented into place. Here you can see me drilling out the hole for the aerial in the roof of the aircraft. I used a 1mm drill bit to do this. Again, there are windows in this part, and they were installed using the same method and glue as previously mentioned. Now it's time to do some spray painting. Humbrol 11 acrylic silver spray paint was used on the various parts you can see here. These consist of the various engine and landing gear components. The spray was applied evenly in a side to side motion to get a good even finish. This paint dries quite quickly so a reapplication is possible after a short time. You can see that I've masked off the areas on the wing spars which I have already painted with Humbrol 78 cockpit green. With the paint dry, I removed the masking tape from those parts I'd used it on to reveal the protected areas. The wing spars were cemented into their locations on the lower wing surface using Revell cement with a needle applicator. I'm using this one as the needle helps get it in really accurate places. Although these spars have really clear locating points, you must take care to get them perfectly perpendicular so they don't lean to one side or the other. Another floor plate can now be added into the correct location and cemented into place. An internal walkway is also added between the two spars which I found a little difficult to get into place, but it is possible with care. The lower wingtip surfaces can now be added to the assembly. These have locating slots and grooves moulded into them, but take care to get them aligned and at the correct angles. Now for the fun part or the part that gave me the most headaches. Adding the motors to the engines. 
you can see that I've already added the motor to this nacelle and built it. I did this off camera so that I could figure out the best way of doing it and it took a bit of trial and error. But as you can see, I did manage to get it to work. The motors I'm using are these tiny RC motors which I bought online for £1 each and come pre-wired which really helps. So here, with the second engine nacelle, I'm going to show you how I installed the motor. I've already removed the parts from the sprue and cleaned them up. The prop is cemented to the spinner, then the backing plate cemented over the top. Here I'm adding the retaining pin, which if you follow the instructions, holds it in place and allows you to turn it freely. Instead, I'm going to use it to plug the hole in the back of the propeller assembly, so I'll leave that to dry completely. I made a small hole in the top of the engine bulkhead so that the wires could pass through. I did it at the top so the wires would pass through the top of the landing gear bay and be less visible in the finished model. Here I'm holding the plug that holds the propeller in the engine nacelle with my pliers. I'm going to very carefully drill a 4mm hole through this part. The motor has a 4mm diameter and will be pushed through this part to hold it in place later. I have to be super careful with this step as the part becomes quite thin and could be crushed by excess pressure from the pliers. The various parts of the nacelle, including the exhaust vent and air intakes, are now added, with the nacelle sandwich around them. The retaining pin is now snipped off the back of the propeller assembly and cleaned up with a nail file. The motor has a 0.5mm diameter shaft, so I selected a drill bit of the same diameter and installed it into my pin vise. I carefully drilled a hole in the back of the propeller assembly as centrally as I could. The motor is then pushed wires first through the front of the nacelle. It is carefully persuaded into place and fits quite snugly in its hole. The propeller can then be added onto the shaft. You can use super glue to help hold these parts in place, but I found they fit well enough without it. The wires are now passed through the hole I made in the bulkhead earlier and it is pushed into position and cemented into place. And there you have it, a motorised engine for this model aircraft. I will periodically continue to check that these motors continue to work as I progress through the build to make sure that I don't damage them in some way. To finish the nacelle off, the air intakes are added to the sides. I've left the engine exhausts off for now and will add them closer to the end of the build. Now it's time to do some soldering. I took some red and black wires, stripped the ends and tinned them. Tinning the wires adds solder to the wires and prevents them from coming apart as I work with them. It also helps when I come to solder them to the next parts. Here the red wire is being soldered to the red wires on the motors. And I will solder the black wire to the two blue wires. The motors are being wired in parallel to ensure they both get an even share of the electrical supply and turn at more or less the same speed when on display. The support struts inside the landing gear bays are now added. These help to hold the nacelles in place on the model in a similar way they did in the actual aircraft. The engine nacelles can now be cemented into place on the wings. You need to make sure you get these the right way round and that everything lines up correctly as you locate them. I had to take special care with the wires here, making sure that they were not in the way or snagged on anything. I'm going to make a start on installing the LED for the landing lights now. I need to do this before I close up the wings. I took this cheap battery powered LED candle which has a built in flicker effect. I thought that it would look good in the wing as it could indicate power fluctuations to the light and add a bit of interest. The candle was easy to disassemble with the LED only being pushed into place. I managed to get about four of these candles for one pound, so had a few LEDs I could play with. I soldered more wires to the LEDs, taking care to observe the polarity. The one for the wing was glued into place using a hot glue gun, but I took care to make sure it didn't melt the plastic of the model. This will help to also insulate the legs and prevent a short circuit. The top of the wing can now be cemented into place. 
This became very fiddly and I had to try and channel the wires down an area of the wing where they would not get in the way. You can see here that there is another LED which I intend to be used inside the fuselage of the aircraft and to be seen through the windows. I wired these up in parallel so that one power supply could operate the LEDs and another separate one for the motors. I did find that this one inside the fuselage wasn't particularly noticeable however and it might have been better to install it further forwards towards the cockpit. With the wings now complete, the cockpit assembly can now be cemented into place. You need to just be aware of the grooves it sits in as if you position it too high or low it will be off center from the rest of the fuselage parts. The rear of the fuselage is now cemented into place. I did find that there were a few gaps in places as I was completing this step. Next, I drilled out the hole where the landing gear would go. I would run the wires out of the aircraft here, but this did mean that I wouldn't be able to use the landing gear as included in the kit. It wouldn't be so noticeable in the diorama as I could hide that with scenic material, but for a display piece you might want to come up with a different method. I applied glue to the roof of the fuselage and then pressed the LED and wires into it. I wanted them to run along the roof of the model so they wouldn't be visible through the door of the aircraft. I did end up using hot glue as well as I found the general purpose glue didn't quite hold them in place long enough to dry. The wires were then fed through the hole in the bottom of the aircraft and the roof placed onto the fuselage. This was then cemented into place. The tail surfaces come in a number of parts. The horizontal stabilizers come in two halves which need cementing together. The elevators are then cemented into the correct location. These can then be added to the correct holes on the side of the aircraft. The twin rudders are assembled in a very similar fashion, coming in halves that need joining together. Then they are cemented into their slots. A bracing part is added between the fuselage and the rudder and you must take care here to make sure everything is aligned correctly. The bomb bay doors come as separate parts and can now be cemented into place. If you wish to depict a bomb load with doors open, now would be the time to do that. The bomb doors will need cutting along the molded lines in order to do this. As I'm making the civilian version though, this won't be needed. The nose and tail covers are now added to the model. These replace the turrets that would be present on the military version. The rear one fits with no issues, but the nose one required extensive cutting of the nose and it was not made completely clear in the instructions that you would have to do this. I carefully removed the plastic and after some time the nose cover was installed. A crew access door is included on the bottom of the nose which can be glued either open or closed. For my diorama though I decided to cement it in the closed position. Here the flaps are being cemented into place. These can be installed, raised or lowered. I decided to depict them lowered as if the aircraft is preparing for takeoff. Humbrol model filler was now used to fill the gaps that have appeared in various places. These include at the fuselage joins and around the engine nacelles. I applied the filler with the end of a cotton bud stick and then worked it into the gaps. It will then be sanded using wet and dry sanding paper to ensure a nice smooth surface. Whilst the filler dries, I used Vallejo liquid mask to cover the various windows and glazed areas of the model to protect them from being painted in the next few steps. Having already applied the liquid mask to the cockpit canopy, this was now glued into place using the general purpose glue from before. The various small details and protrusions around the aircraft are now cemented into their various holes. The landing gear legs are then cemented into place. I found this to be a fiddly step, so some tweezers and patience would be needed here. I also added the wheels onto the legs, attempting to line up the flattened edge of the wheel with the ground so that it looks as though it is in rest on the tarmac. Now it's time to give the model a coat of Humbrol 11 acrylic silver spray paint. Some small parts have still been left off and will be added later such as the landing gear covers. The lower surface of the aircraft will remain in the silver finish, 
but the top surface will have the silver as a base color. Here you can see that I've applied masking tape to the aircraft to help ensure that I get a nice neat line between the top and lower paint schemes. Humbrol 29 enamel dark earth paint was thinned with a little white spirit and then brushed over the entire top surface of the model. Thinning the paint will help prevent brush strokes but a number of layers will be needed. When I was happy with the brown, Humbrol 30 dark green enamel was also thinned and then applied in a camouflage pattern following the instructions by eye. This colour would also need a number of layers. With the paint now fully cured after a night of drying, the masking tape is removed and any paint bleed can be tidied up later. Humbrol 135 acrylic satin varnish was thinned with water and then applied to the entire model. This satin layer will form as the base coat for decals and should help prevent them from silvering when they are applied. The decals are now cut from the sheet and separated into more manageable pieces. As before, when I made the cockpit of the model, they are soaked in warm water and then slid off the paper onto the model, which has already been given a coat of decal fix to help soften them. You have to be really careful with the large letter decals as you run the risk of damaging them, but fortunately I managed to apply them without too much trouble. Whilst you watch this step, I'll tell you a little about the actual Armstrong Whitworth Whitley. Originally introduced to RAF service in 1937, the Whitley was considered obsolete at the outbreak of the Second World War, but was superior to the biplane bombers it had been designed to replace. Intended as a medium night bomber, it took part in many night raids of the early stages of World War II, until it was replaced by the newer four-engined heavy bombers in 1941 and 1942. It still undertook special operations, dropping spies and paratroopers, while some were converted for transport and maritime reconnaissance, and a coastal command aircraft can also be built from this kit. Some were converted for civilian use, however, with all armament being removed and falling under the use of BOAC, British Overseas Aircraft Corporation. The aircraft of this kit depicts a BOAC converted Whitley in 1942. The aircraft was used to transport passengers between Stockholm as part of the ball bearing run, so called as they also collected ball bearings which were crucial to the British war industry. It was found to be unsuitable and was replaced by faster aircraft such as Mosquitoes. BOAC operated diplomatic and civilian flights throughout the Second World War in a variety of converted aircraft types. With the decals now dry, Humbrol 49 matte varnish enamel paint was applied to the top surface, whilst 135 satin varnish was painted on the lower silver surface. These layers will help protect the decals in the next few steps. I used matte on the top surface to give it a more dull look, while satin on the lower to preserve the shine of the silver. Next, Citadel Nun Oil Acrylic Wash was applied to the model. I had to make sure some of the decals were cut in places to conform to the moulded details, such as on the ailerons. The wash was then brushed over the model, with the intention that it would collect in the panel lines and recess details. The excess wash was then removed from the model using a cotton bud soaked in acrylic thinners. Brushing in the direction of the airflow you can get quite realistic stains, along with the recessed details retaining the wash and the raised surfaces having it removed. I used an excess piece of sprue which had a pointed end to gently scrape the liquid mask away from the various windows on the model. This seemed to work reasonably well, but I did notice a little bit of peeling of the paint in a few places, which I ended up having to touch up after. Humbrol 33 matte black acrylic was used to carefully paint the propeller and spinner. I had to make sure that I didn't place it in the wrong place and ruin any of the previously painted areas. I repeated this process for the tyres on the wheels, but in hindsight I should have left the wheels off and painted them before adding them to the model. Having previously cemented them in place however, I found that painting them in place was quite difficult to do, but with some care and patience I managed to succeed. Humbrol 24 matte trainer yellow was used to pick out the tips of the propeller blades. I did this using a fine paintbrush. Humbrol 85 satin black enamel was painted onto the inside areas of the landing gear doors. These are still on the sprue and were previously spray painted silver. 
Humbrol 53 gunmetal grey acrylic was brushed onto the engine exhausts, which had already been painted silver. This gunmetal grey acrylic will dull them down a bit and add a little contrast. The clear part for the landing light is now glued into its slot in the wing, using the same general purpose glue as the previous clear parts. The engine exhausts were then carefully added to the model, taking care to not spoil the paint finish. Humbrol 33 matte black was then dry brushed down the sides of the engines and over the top of the wings to give the impression of exhaust stains. I did this working in the direction of airflow, carefully dragging the residual paint down the model using a medium paintbrush. The landing gear doors were next to be added to the model, using the Revell cement for this task to accurately place the glue. The crew door is cemented into position and I found it needed to be held in place until it had set, due to the fact it is angled at 90 degrees from the fuselage. The access ladder can then also be cemented into place, and it's at this stage that the aircraft is now complete and ready for installation to the diorama. So let's get started on the diorama and bring it all together. The first thing I needed were some elves. I found these model scene N-gauge figures in a local model shop and thought they would make a good representation of elves. Some might need a little modification, but I think I can make it work. I also need an extra crew member who is going to be exiting the plane, and I have the perfect one for that. So out of the Airfix Luftwaffe personnel set, I'm going to take this figure, who is in the perfect pose to be climbing the ladder on the Whitley. Again, these parts were given a wash in warm soapy water and left to dry. They were then given a coat of matte black spray paint that I bought for a pound in a local home shop. This should help all future layers of paint stick to the figures. The Luftwaffe figure was given the same treatment as the crew figures I'd previously painted, with the first layer being Humbrol 62 matte leather, I then used Humbrol 61 matte flesh acrylic to highlight his face, 33 matte black acrylic was painted onto his boots, and 26 matte khaki was used on his belt. Citadel non-oil was then washed over the figure to help apply contrast and bring out the details. I'll leave him to dry and move on to the elves. I used this green acrylic paint, which was thinned with Tamiya acrylic thinners as the general green colour of the elves' clothing. A number of coats would be needed. I used Humbrol Matte Scarlet number 60 to paint their legs, as many popular versions of Santa's elves tend to have red and green as their colour choice. Again, Humbrol 61 was used to highlight some of their faces, whilst Humbrol 86 Light Olive Drab was used on some others to help promote some inclusive diversity. And here, they're pretty much finished. I've painted their bases with Humbrol 34 Matte White to represent snow, whilst also picking out the suitcases they are carrying in purples, blues and yellows to try and represent Christmas presents. Moving back to the crew figure, I removed him from his base using a sharp knife and then covered up the missing paint using matte black number 33. Here is the Nordic fir tree that I also received from Airfix. I know that this is a Hornby product intended for model railways, but Airfix falls under the Hornby Hobbies family and they were more than happy to provide one. I picked up these battery powered LED lights for about £2 in a local home store and it has a number of different flashing patterns which I thought would be great to represent lights on the Christmas tree. I wrapped the tree in a spiral pattern and glued the end of the LEDs to the top. I do end up having to undo this later in order to install it in the diorama but it helps prove that it is possible. You have to be careful as the tree is quite fragile and you can see a lot of the foliage scatter falling off as I do this. Now I need a base for my diorama. Not being one to waste things, I'm going to use the box that Airfix sent me the kit and paint in. I decided to fold the lid back over on itself with the aim of making it the back scene, but that meant that I had to cut the top flap off. I applied hot glue to the edge of the box, then folded the top over and held it in place until it had set. So that I would get a nice smooth transition between the diorama and the back scene, I hot glued a large piece of corrugated card to the back scene and the base in a gentle curve. I then removed the excess from the edges. 
I'm going to use a familiar technique for making a bit of hard standing for the aircraft to sit on. I took some cardboard and cut it into rough rectangles and these will eventually be the concrete style slabs of the runway. I positioned them on the diorama in a way that looked pleasing, then hot glued them on. The excess on the edges would be cut away. I made a little mound on the other side of the base out of off cuts of cardboard layered up and then a piece of paper glued over the top. The entire base was then covered with cheap wall filler I got in a home store for about a pound. When the filler was dry, I took the base outside and sanded it down using some medium grade sandpaper to try and smooth it off. Next, I sprayed the base of the diorama with this cheap white spray paint. This will be the base for the snow I will add later. I used a cheap black spray paint to paint the back scene, which would depict a nighttime setting. With all that paint now dry, I brought it back inside and used Humbrol 123 Extra Dark Sea Grey Satin Enamel to paint the runway area of the diorama. I'm hoping that the satin effect of this paint will make the runway look as though it is a bit icy. White poster paint was then painted over the display base, and I will use this to help give the impression of snowy hills in the distance. A number of coats of this paint will be required as it is quite thin. I drilled a hole in the top of the mound which would allow me to install the tree and lights. I pushed the LED string lights up from the bottom of the diorama and pulled them out to the top of the scene. I hot glued the battery box to the inside wall of the base. I found this geometric puzzle eraser set for very cheap in a local shop and I thought that I could cut it up into various shapes and sizes to represent Christmas presents. The tree was now wrapped in the LED lights again and then glued into place on the diorama. I then added all the various presents to the bottom of the tree. I glued them into place using a general purpose glue and stacked them in a random and interesting way. The colours of the presents didn't look realistic to me, so I took a variety of different colour acrylic paints and proceeded to paint them to make them look better. I used a variety of reds, yellows, oranges, blues and greens. When they were dry, I used a silver acrylic paint pen to draw on a representation of string, which had been used during the wrapping process. Superglue was used to attach some very thin tinsel I'd made by stripping ribbon into thinner strings. This was wrapped around the tree in a similar way to the lights. I needed to create some kind of radio for the elves to use on the diorama, so I took a cube of the eraser and glued it onto the base. I then attached a piece of sprue to one side. This sprue had previously been stretched using the heated method. This part would look like an aerial. Humbrol 64 matte light grey acrylic was then used to paint all of these parts. I positioned some elves around this radio, gluing them into place, and I chose the ones I thought looked most suitable. This one required modification by removing the tool he was holding and adding earphones made of a piece of wire which had the end split in two and glued to his head. He was also glued into place. This is the sledge I made for Santa and as you can see it's a bit broken. I made this by making a box out of card, cutting the sides to the required shape and adding a raised floor on the inside. The sack is made from a crumpled piece of paper and painted brown. The runners for the sledge are cardboard, sprayed silver, and then the ends folded up. This was also glued into place on the diorama and surrounded by suitable figures who looked as though they were trying to fix it. Next, I drilled a hole in the base for the wires of the aircraft to pass through. The model was placed on the base and the wires carefully thread through the hole. Here I've drilled a hole for a variable resistor and installed it to the side of the base. We're looking at it from inside the base here. I soldered this in series with the motors inside the aircraft, which I'm hoping will allow me to control the speed at which they turn. I don't have any specific battery holders at the moment, so for now I'm going to tape the wires onto the batteries. I'm using a AA battery for the motors and a coin cell for the LED lights inside the model. With the aircraft in position, I then glued the crew figure I previously painted into place on the ladder. I then proceeded to further populate the scene by adding the remaining elf figures in various locations. 
To finish off the scene, I needed a Father Christmas figure. I found this guy in a local model shop for about £4. To me, that seems like a lot of money, seeing as I can get a whole model kit for that. But with a deadline to finish this coming up quickly, I didn't really have time to convert an existing figure. If I'm honest, this is not a bad looking guy. He too was then glued into place on the diorama, and it's nearly finished. No North Pole scene would be complete without some actual snow, so I'm using the Knock Powdery Snow product here, sprinkled over the entire diorama to help add a bit of texture. I try my best to avoid the areas that may have not had snow or had it brushed away, such as the aircraft, runway and presence, but this product is easily removable with a dry brush if it gets in the wrong place. The silver acrylic marker, as used before, was now applied in dots to the black back scene to represent stars in the night sky. And it's at this stage that the model and diorama is now complete. For those of you who might not know, this diorama made it into the Airfix Online Advent Calendar 2019 as part of a parody version of The Night Before Christmas. And you can see that video on my channel. I'll put a link in the description. So what do I think of the model kit of the Armstrong Whitworth Whitley in 172nd scale from Airfix? If I'm honest, I think it's great. It's got fantastic details inside and out. The fit is, for the most part, really good. The instructions are easy to follow and the decals are of a good quality. It is let down by the lack of crew figures the strange gaps that appear in a few places around the fuselage and engines, and the fact that at the time I received it, it was retailing for £37, which in my opinion is a little high, seeing as you can get larger aircraft for less. I am aware that as of the time of this video, it is possible to get it cheaper now, which I completely recommend. The tooling for this kit dates back to 2015, where it was a new addition to the range as the Whitley Mark V, but this version features new parts and decals as the GR Mark VII version. I feel that this kit might be a bit of a stretch to someone who is new to the hobby, and would recommend this to those with a little more experience under their belts. I feel as though I managed to finish mine to quite a good standard, especially with motorised engines and illuminated landing light installed. So what do I think about the diorama? For the first full diorama I've built on my channel, and seeing as it features lights and animations, I think I've done quite well. Snow in any scale can be quite difficult to do, and I feel I might need a bit more practice. I had to overcome some little challenges and solve a few problems as I went, but I'm pretty happy with what I managed to achieve. As always, let me know what you think of my finished kit, the diorama, and my techniques in the comments below. As always, don't forget that I'm interested in hearing suggestions for other kits or videos you'd like to see on my channel too. All that's left to say is thanks for watching, and I'll see you all on the workbench again next time.